don't know how I got here My steps I cannot trace But there must be some reason why All right, I've got Becky Burns in the studio with us. Becky is a member here at Harvest Jacksonville and is married to Josh, a native Jacksonvillian. (laughs) Yep. And uh, she is going to share her testimony with us and also what God's been doing in her life and teaching her and how she's serving the Lord. So, Becky, let's start at the beginning. And by the way, welcome to uh, the studio here. Yeah. And... uh, Want to just tell us your story? Why don't you start with giving us a little family background and and tell us about your childhood and right on up into meeting Josh. So yeah, all right. So I grew up here in Jacksonville. Uh, we lived here. We moved here when I was about five years old. So this is pretty much uh, where I grew up as a kid. So I have three other siblings. I have a sister, Christine. Well, by the way, where did you live before? So we were in Louisiana. That's where I was born. Really? Yeah, we lived there I, for a few short years. Okay. Have you gone back? I've been back to visit multiple times, but we haven't moved back or anything like that. Okay, because you got family back there. Oh, yeah. My yeah. mom's entire side of the family is over there. Northern or Southern? Southern. And uh, Slidell. Okay. So pretty Southern. So Louisiana. Cajun food and all that. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, it's good stuff. You cook Cajun for Josh? No, okay. not really, but he loves it, so I probably should. Oh, <laughs> so there you go. a good reminder to do that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you came to Jacksonville very young. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so we um, lived here throughout my entire childhood. So I have, again, I have three siblings. So my sister and then my two brothers, and then we lived with our mom and our dad and stayed here all the way through. So elementary school. Birth order, school, you are? Third. Third. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we stayed here from elementary, middle school to high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I met Josh uh, Right at the end of my senior year, and he was in his first year of college, so I was, you know, super smitten because he was like my cool college boyfriend. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, so it was real cool. <laughs> and uh, we ended up started dating. But you went to the same high school? No, we went to a different high school. You did? Okay. Yeah. So I went to Bartram Trail, and Josh went to Nice. That's but, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So my stepbrother, because my parents ended up getting divorced when I was, I think I was 12 or 13, they separated. Okay. And then my dad ended up marrying my stepmom, Chris, who comes here, mm-hmm. and she has a son, David. And David went to Nice High School and became really good friends with Josh. And so David invited Josh over, and then I met Josh, and here we are 12 oh, years later. So Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So we Was went- that pretty traumatic for you, though, at 12 years old? Um... That's a that's a tough question to answer. I think that the separation between my parents was actually quite needed. So okay. I think for me mm-hmm. as a kid, it was more relieving than it was. Yeah. Sad. I mean, it was sad. Like, I think about it now as an adult, like, it was sad. Right. But um, at the time, I was more just kind of like, okay, yeah. this is this is a good thing. Okay. So, mm-hmm. and plus, we got a lot of blessings out of it. I mean, yeah. my stepmom's awesome, mm-hmm. and my stepbrother's, he's awesome too. So it ended yeah. up being a really good thing yeah looking back okay so good. um none of us were saved at that point though i think that that's uh, probably an important answer as well right. uh, to say as well but um did you have any church going type thing or affiliation you know we had a little bit so my grandparents would take us to church but it was catholic church mm-hmm. um we did that very infrequently so it was never like a consistent thing so whenever i was with my grandparents i'd go to church um i can remember my parents taking us when we were small kids for holidays okay. um but that that never really kind of kept up so in our house we were taught that there was a god and we were taught about jesus mm-hmm. but we never kind of like delved deeper into it like we weren't necessarily reading the bible together we weren't necessarily praying together mm-hmm. um we were just kind of told that that is a thing and that that yeah. is real. And that was the extent of it. So was there like moral teaching that this is the way we live? And um, I don't know that I would say that there was moral teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, obviously our parents taught us right for wrong. Good, you know, good yeah. versus bad. I wouldn't say that that was necessarily rooted because of what the Bible says though. Gotcha. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I didn't meet the Lord until after college. So Josh and I stayed together from high school through college. We ended up getting married um, after college when I was in graduate school. So that was seven, seven years ago. Were you in Orlando at the time? Yeah, mm-hmm. I was in Orlando. So we moved. So I went to FSU for college. So I left Jacksonville when I was 18, went to FSU for college, stayed there till I was 23. And then Josh and I moved to Orlando and lived there for about a year. So this is kind of, this is where the testimony kind of ties in. So 
Josh was working an absolutely miserable job at UCF mm -hmm. um, doing food production management type work um, with the restaurants for a company called Aramark. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, his boss was not very nice to him and treated him quite poorly. And mm -hmm. so for that year that he was working, he was very miserable. And when a job opportunity came up, he was all for it. Um, and this job opportunity happened to be here in Jacksonville. And at the time, I had zero desire to come back to Jacksonville. I thought, I've lived there my whole life. I've moved away. I want to go see what else there is to offer. But Josh was so miserable. I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to say, no, we can't go back to Jacksonville. Stay here and hate your life. Mm. So he ended up accepting the job. And it ended up being the best thing that could have possibly happened to us because mm -hmm. We ended up moving back here at the end of 2015. And throughout college and high school, um, Stephanie would invite me to come to church. So I'd come to Harvest very infrequently. Mm -hmm. And I really, really enjoyed the service. I felt like the messages were applicable. They were relatable. I got something from them. Um, and then I felt like I didn't feel like anything was being shoved down my throat. I didn't feel like anybody was judging me. And I felt like if I had questions or if I had wanted to take the next step, that this would be a safe group of people to talk to. Mm -hmm. And so when we moved back to Jacksonville, um, Josh and I began toying around with the idea of going to church. And it was no question in my mind that it would be harvest. I was like, duh, that's where I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. Stephanie's mm -hmm. there. I already know the pastor. Like, hello, like no brainer. And so one night at the very end of 20, I think it was 20, 2015, um, Josh had a scare with his dad and that's his whole separate testimony story. Mm -hmm. But he basically made a deal with God that if his dad was okay, we were going to start going to church. Okay. So God used it because <laughs> we started going to church. That's what, uh, that was going to be my next question is yeah. that you toying around with this idea of going to church. Mm -hmm. Was there something behind that motivating to like we're missing something or, you know? Yeah. So we... I think we began, Josh came from a kind of a, not really the same background as me, but kind of similar as far as he knew there was God. He tried, you know, he knew about Jesus and mm -hmm. Josh, you know, he came from a, a very, a much more um, Catholic home than I did. Like mm -hmm. he was in all of the stuff. Very for, active. Yeah. yeah. Very active in it. Um, but he kind of felt the same way I did. Like, I think the way I viewed it was there's a God, but how can we know, like, you know, if it's this Jesus guy or Buddha or whatever, you know, it was just, there's a God and he loves all of us the same. That was like our take. Mm -hmm. And then I think, as we started moving forward, I don't, I don't, I can't really tell you where the shift was in my mind for it. I don't know. I just know that Josh made that deal with God and I thought, well, I got to follow Josh. So I guess I'll do it. It wasn't like I was thinking there's something missing in my life. I need something to fulfill it. It was just, well, all right, like what's going to be the harm here? Mm -hmm. And so once we started coming to church, Josh got really, really into it. And I was into it. Like I thought it was great. This is the fall of 19. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> of you did live in the 1900s. But I, I did. For a short period it was of time. 2015, the yes. fall of 2015. I was on yes. sabbatical. You were. That's so right. So you were hearing a different preacher every week almost. We were. Yeah. yeah. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. And so I remember Josh was getting really into it and he was like, I want to keep coming back. And I was like, well, I'm not going to complain. I'll keep coming back too. Josh ended up getting saved. Uh, I think like six months before I did, it was just a few short months mm -hmm. after coming to harvest. It was just the wheels clicked for him, you know, because yeah. God does that. And I though, I was very much so in the camp of, I need there to be irrefutable proof. Mm -hmm. I need to understand through science. I need to understand through arguments that this is the way and that there is no other way. Because if I'm going to yeah. invest my life, my faith and my trust, it's got to be right. Mm -hmm. And so when Josh started to believe, I didn't understand like how he could, so confidently say that Jesus was Lord. And so it got me intrigued. And so I went on, I think it was like it was six to eight months of just constant research. So I was watching all of the debates between, you know, William Lane Craig and atheists, Frank Turek and atheists, and mm -hmm. any debate I could get my hands on, any lecture I could get my hands on. I read a couple of books. Um, I had numerous conversations with Stephanie um, and then a couple of her friends. Mm -hmm. And throughout that time, I would read the Bible as well, trying to make sense of it. And I would pray and I just never... And I was just like, okay, I mean, I guess this is the thing. Like, I'll just keep reading and researching. And all of the research that I was going through, it just started to, I just, it was like, okay, this makes sense. Like, that argument makes sense. You can't really refute that argument. The part that I was missing, though, was that faith, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the faith that I can't know the answer to every question. And so, I was grappling with that. I was like, well, I can't know the answer to this, so how can I actually believe? And so, 
I'll never forget this because it was so powerful. It was the middle of 2016 and Stephanie and a couple of her friends had come over because we were going to have another conversation about Christianity and like arguing against science and facts and whatever. We had pretty much gotten into a habit of it. And um, that day I had read in the book of John um, chapter nine, Mm -hmm. chapter nine, verse three was the specific verse, but it's when there is the blind guy standing outside and the people are asking Jesus, what did this man do to become blind? Like what, what did he do to deserve this? Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, he's done nothing. His parents haven't sinned. He had nobody. He's like, he is blind so God can be glorified. And Jesus takes and he spits. And when you say they hadn't sinned, you're not saying that they lived a perfect sinless life. Correct. You're saying that his blindness was not a, directly caused by his sin. Right? Correct. Or his parents having done some evil, therefore God punished them with a with a blind child, right? Yes, correct. That, that's, that's what, yeah, okay. Exactly. And so to heal him, Jesus spits in the dirt and yeah. then creates mud, rubs it over his eyes, and he can see. And I read that verse, and I thought, I didn't, honestly, I didn't think anything of it. I just read the, I read the chapter and yeah. called it a day. That night, our friend was talking about um, other people's testimonies through the Bible, and he said, "There's a," he said, there was a tribe out, some remote location somewhere in the world. I can't remember. I want to say New Guinea, but I don't quote me on that. Anyway, this tribe was super cannibalistic, mm-hmm. and they were terrible. Obviously, mm-hmm. they were eating and murdering each other. And um, there were a group of missionaries who were going to translate the Bible into their language. And the people in this tribe, I don't know how they got them to read the Bible, but whatever, however they did, God did. And they got to the part in John where um, they, uh, they read the part where Jesus creates the mud mm-hmm. and they stopped. And they were like, wait a second, because this tribe is pretty, you know, under, underdeveloped or whatever. They have like, you know, witch doctors, like the doctors mm-hmm. who do stuff like that to heal people. And they were like, the doctor that we have heals us with mud. So maybe we can get behind this guy. That's literally how they responded. And wow. then the next thing you know, the whole, like the village is saved. They're not eating each other anymore. And I remember hearing that story and our friend had said, he was like, at the end of that verse, at the end of that, that, that section, it says, this man was made blind so God could be glorified. God mm-hmm. was glorified in that story when Jesus healed him and made him blind or made him able to see, right? right. Glory was displayed there. But then our friend made a point, God was glorified again through that same passage when that tribe in New Guinea was saved through that verse. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, it, all of the things that I didn't know, all the things that I couldn't answer didn't matter anymore. It was like, it was like, God, he opened my eyes and it was like, he was like, listen, you're not going to have all of the answers, but I'm real. And then in that moment, it was, he was glorified another time through that verse. Wow. And so I can't explain it. I don't know. Ever since then, I don't like, obviously I wish I could have the answers to some of the questions, but it just doesn't matter anymore. It just doesn't matter because in that moment, it was like, okay, you're real. You are who you, know you say you are. Yeah, yeah. Like it was, you know, the veil that they talk about lifting from your eyes, absolutely lifted. And for the next yeah. like a month, I was on this high that I can't explain. It was like, I don't care what happens. It doesn't matter. Like it literally doesn't matter because I know God and I will never forget that. And so like, I think about that moment and it's like, that is absolutely the moment that I was mm. like, okay, you're real. I'm going to surrender my life and I'm going to do the best I can with my decisions mm-hmm. um, to honor you well. And I, you know, obviously it's a struggle every day, but yeah. I just think about like how, like he loves us enough to do that. I don't know how else to explain it. I feel so insignificant, mm. like, you know, mm-hmm. and, and he's so powerful and he wants, he wants, I don't know. He just wants to do that for everybody. So I don't yeah. know. I don't know what else to say about it. So, so do, you, do you remember along that journey, the conviction of sin in your life and, like so the sin problem and the cross is the answer. Yes. So that, one of my questions throughout that was, mm-hmm. why did he have to die on a cross? I was like, I don't get it. That just seems stupid. It seems like, and I, and I say right. this pre pre salvation. That seems dumb. Why would that be the case? Like, and you know, I heard other arguments like a oh, suicide mission, like you know, those stupid arguments. And I was kind of along that line. And and prior to salvation, so it was explained to me. Yeah. When when the Bible talks about the foolishness of the cross, you identified with that. So that's. It seems yeah. foolish that that would be the way that God would save people. Yeah. Is somebody dying on the cross? Yes. On a cross? Exactly how I felt. Yeah. And then it was explained to me about how God was, or how Jesus was the sacrifice, because in the Old Testament times, mm-hmm. they would sacrifice the clean um, animals. Mm-hmm. And then 
because again, they're without blemish, they're without sin. So how they can pay the price for sin when I can't? I'm, ba- mm-hmm. I'm morally bankrupt. Bankrupt. Yeah. And when that was explained to me that Jesus took the punishment as a free, sinless person mm-hmm. because he could pay the debt. It. I don't. I don't want to say like it made sense. It made sense. I don't even know if it made sense on a logical level. It didn't click or make sense to me until the day that I heard that story about the New Guinea tribe and he opened my eyes. Then it and was then like, everything made sense. Yeah, I was just like, okay, no, that makes sense. Even like, if you didn't have every single question answered. Correct. So I don't, I don't know that prior to that moment, I felt convicted of sin. I mm-hmm. don't even know that I'd given it much thought, maybe a, a little bit, but definitely afterwards. I was like, okay, like, what am I doing that is not, you know, representing you? Or what am I doing that is is, um, I guess, sinful is the best yeah. way to put it. So. I wish I could go back in time. Maybe you can help me out on this, remember. Yeah. But I remember I was on vacation. <clears throat> well, yeah, I was on vacation and traveling. I think we we're on the road in Tennessee somewhere or something. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if this is during sabbatical or, or not when, because that 2016, I was obviously back from sabbatical when that happened. So, But I remember I, I talked to you on the phone for like an hour Yes. Was that, where, do you remember when that was in the timeline? That was previous. Because I was going to say, because you were very confused. I was. And I, I, I remember that conversation. I, I, I remember like praying and like, Lord, break through to her, you <laughs> yes. know, because you were all over the board with what you were saying. Yes. And, and I remember because I think another reason I knew I was saved is because in that moment I wanted to get baptized. Prior to that, I didn't. So I was yeah. confused on whether or not I was saved. But any time I talked about or thought about baptism, I was like, mm, I don't really want to do that. But the moment I got saved, it was, I want to get baptized right this second. So that's, yeah. that was another tangible way that I knew it was different because it was like, I don't care. I want everybody to know. But I remember asking you about the baptism and I was like, you know, I don't even know if I believe. And if I do believe, it's been a short time. And then you pointed out the verse. I think it's an Acts where like a whole bunch of people get baptized after knowing God for like two seconds. Right. And so then it, it you the know, that brought day. me some clarity. Yeah. yeah, on the same day. Yeah. yeah. So that I remember that conversation, but yeah, I was very Okay. Yeah. Very so Yeah, I remember you were confused. And and I'm I'm a logical thinking guy as well. You 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 seem to be a logical yeah. thinking gal. And so for me, this all makes sense because I've walked mm-hmm. in it for so many years and I, I know these truths. And so I remember explaining to you the gospel and just the scriptures and everything yeah. on this phone call. And to me it all just lines up real simple. But I could tell you were all jumbled, and it was yes. you were you were bringing in your own thoughts and beliefs yep. and background and ideas and mixing it all in, and 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 I'm like, and finally I, I do remember at one point, I think I got off the phone and said to Lacey, I said God's going to have to, I said I, because I was so much trying to explain it all to you, thinking, yeah. look, it's this simple, look, yeah. look, 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 and it just wasn't connecting with you yeah. yet, and uh, and I remember kind of that prayer at the end where I was like, Lord, you're going to have to, I can't seem to get it across to her, you know, yeah. which is so true. It's funny because we think we can, yes. but ultimately it's the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's the Spirit of God that has to open that. So, you know, yeah. we all got to be faithful. Stephanie was faithful and that, yes. and that one hour phone call or whatever, I was faithful to, to deliver it to you, but God had to open your eyes. Yes. No, I, and I think it lends so much credibility to the fact that it's a heart issue and it's not anything else. Because oh, yeah. logically, I knew, like, you know, the argument for the re- resurrection and why, you know, these different theories or, or whatever, like what kind of followed mm-hmm. with it and what didn't. And I knew those things logically and I knew that there couldn't be an argument for it, but I still just couldn't, like, take the leap of faith. But yeah, so I think then God, you know, he just took my heart of stone and made it flesh. And it was like, Oh, okay, well here we are. Awesome. So, but yeah, Steph was, was a huge part of that. She was very faithful. Oh, so I'm glad no you said doubt. that. She was a faithful witness oh, yeah. to you. Oh yeah. For, and so patient. For several years. I, if I were her, I would have wanted to wring my neck like 500 times. So she was so, so patient. Do you remember when she first started witnessing to you? Do I remember when? Yeah. Um, I honestly, I don't, I can't think of a specific time. I think her witness was really subtle. So she, mm-hmm. I don't know that she ever, until the time that I began really investigating, mm-hmm. I don't know that she ever sit down and like yeah. explicitly shared the gospel. But I remember. Um, she reached out to you and invited uh, yeah. you to church and all that for years. So yes. Just on, yeah. Yeah. And she would just, different things about what she would decide to do had changed from what I knew previously. Yeah. So that kind of got me intrigued, but mm-hmm. she was always just yeah. so patient. That's awesome. So patient, but yeah. It's a good, good reminder for those of us who are still reaching out to family members and friends. Yes. and it's slow going so no one's out of reach that's right awesome